based upon what's happening in the world around us. These words Jesus gives to us. What I want to preach about today is, won't you be my neighbor? Now I need to inquire how many people know who this is. You know who that man is? Mr. Rogers. For some of our younger folks may not know who this is, but that is Mr. Who? Rogers. Right, Mr. Rogers. Now some may not know Mr. Rogers, you might remember Mr. Robinson's neighborhood uh, that Eddie Murphy did on Saturday Night Live, but I want to talk about Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, of course, his song had a theme song. Right? A song that he would sing whenever he would come out, and the song, if you would please indulge me today, simply goes high. It's a beautiful day, a beautiful day, a beautiful day. Would you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Right? Y'all remember that song? Yeah. A beautiful day, and, and, and he would come out, right? And Mr. Martin would come out and put on his. Uh, Red sweater, or put his shoes on, come out to the TV audience there, right in his little home, and he'd feed his fish. Ever remember that, Mr. Rogers? In fact, I have to confess today that for me, my family hails from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, Mr. Rogers is actually a native of Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Pittsburgh, and so he actually was on TV in Pittsburgh first before he got to a national audience. So my family so loved Mr. Rogers that I had Mr. Rogers toys. I had a trolley. In fact, I had that very trolley. Now I have to tell you, I wanted Star Wars, right? I wanted Batman, and I got Mr. Rogers. The kids in the neighborhood were not impressed because my neighborhood wasn't Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. But nonetheless, there was, of course, Mr. Rogers, who was on TV uh, for many years on public television. And some may not realize, in fact, there's a movie coming out soon uh, starring Tom Hanks as Mr. Rogers. I had seen a sort of fake blog that said Tom Hanks is determined to play every single American he can on the movie screen. Uh, but he's going to be playing Mr. Rogers soon. But Mr. Rogers actually began as a Presbyterian pastor. He actually was a pastor who also had experience in TV. And what he decided was television was the best way for him to reach a very wide audience. And so he developed the Mr. Rogers show to go and especially then reach out to who? Children, right? And the show would address some real issues and fears and concerns that children would have. And Mr. Rogers actually had the following quote that he would often say, that love isn't a state of perfect care. It's an active now, like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is, right here and now. So Mr. Rogers, again, based his whole show was on the premise of teaching children how to love, how to love themselves and how to love others in their neighborhood. And I'm sure you may agree with me today that we need a lot more Mr. Rogers in the neighborhood today. In fact, we don't even just need a lot more Mr. Rogers. We just need a lot more neighbors who know how to be neighborly in the world today. So we are today gathered at Journey of Faith in our series, our sermon series, to again look at how we live, how do we move, how do we operate as followers of Jesus. And we are in the sixth week of our time together in the sermon series. And what you may recall again is we've done the following before this. Again, we started by encouraging, by sort of inviting for you and I to live a life where we are praying daily, 
that every day we take time to speak to God, not just moments to speak, but speak as we live throughout the day and to listen to God moving. We've also encouraged us to worship and to gather just as we are right now so that we can be recharged, so we can get reconnected. Because again, in this world, it's so easy to get lost and to forget about who God is and who we're called to be. In fact, right now, my phone is in need of being replaced because it won't hold a charge. I can charge it and maybe a half hour later, it's already needing to be charged again. You ever felt that way in life? Like you just can't seem to hold a charge and you need to continue to be what? Charged again? Well, guess what? When we worship weekly, we come here to be recharged, to let God's Holy Spirit recharge us. And then hopefully we also take time each day to read God's Word. And I invite you once again, I will point out that in our, on your own bulletin you got, on the followers order service, you'll see at the bottom, there are daily scripture readings to do each day of this week. And in fact, this week, they actually focus on the understanding of worship. And so I actually, I'm reading God's Word, so I invite you to take time every day and just read this scripture. So we are invited Again, to pray, to worship, to read. Pray, worship, read. Pray, worship, read. But if all we do is pray, worship, read, the only thing that happens here is that we pray, worship, read. If all you do in your life is simply just pray, worship, and read, let me say you're not doing what God called us to do. See, your prayers, your worship, your reading of God's word should produce something in your life as well. Y'all got it? Did you got it? Say, I got it. <laughs> it should produce. There should be something seen by living as God calls, there should be something done. And that's where we start to move in our next ones, to serve or to work for peace and justice, to serve, to uplift, to look out for, to feed, to clothe, to encourage, to serve. And then finally today is this one, to build, and we say spiritual, but I would sort of paraphrase it in that way, to build authentic what? Friendships. To build spiritual, authentic friendships. Do you know how hard it is to find a good friend? Good friends are worth their weight in gold, silver, and plutonium. Good friends are worth so much. It's so hard whenever you lose a good friend. It's so difficult to find a what? Good friend. And again, church is the place, is a community where we should be cultivating friendships, authentic, it says, but just being real, not simply it, it sort of extending pleasantries and niceties to each other, but building relationships and friendships together is what we're really called to be about. To move us in a way beyond our limited circles and to get us together and to see who each of us is. See, Jesus met his disciples and he tells them as we read in John, he said, I don't even call you servants, I'm calling you friends now, for you are my friends and you are friends to one another. And he asked of his disciples, but it's so important, he asked for them to simply love one another. And then by their love, what he then invites them to do is to what is called bear fruit. If you look at it right here. He says that as you love each other, what you should do then is bear fruit, fruit that will last. Again, produce something. Do something that people can see and feel and know that change happens. Do something that's lasting and for other people to experience as well. 
And that's again what we're called to do is to bear fruit, to make a difference, to make a change in the lives of each other here, but also again in the lives of the world out there. In the places where we work, the places we go to school, the places we play, to bring forth the change. People will change you, right? Sometimes when someone gets an attitude to me, if I'm in the checkout line, or driving my car, and someone cuts me off, it's amazing how quickly people can change me. But the thing is, we're not called to be changed by others. We're called to be changed to others and produce the fruit that's different than we see in the world today. God knows we, we need to bear fruit today as if we never had to bear before. And some of the fruit of the Spirit that we're called to do is in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is what? <clears throat> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. Again, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the fruits that we're called to, to bear. But when you look out at the world today, when you look at our own society, when you look at our own nation, our own state, when you look at the affairs of things, are these the fruit that you see? They're there. They're not as prominent as others that have grown. The song speaks of strange fruit growing. We have other fruit growing prominently today. As you see the fruit of bigotry and prejudice and racism that is so prominent and celebrated and manufactured and put out today. Don't you see this? So much more today. But again, we're called by Christ to produce a different fruit. And we have to be aware, I hope again we realize what's happening to us, what's taking place. You know, the FBI director, the current FBI director, not the former, but the current one, Director Ray, reported to Congress, this missed many people's headlines, back on July 23rd, Christopher Ray stood before Congress, and he warned Congress, and he warned our nation, that once again, a foreign entity is trying to interfere in our elections. Our, our FBI director, appointed by the current president, is it somebody outside? The current FBI director said to Congress that once again, a foreign government, particularly the Russians, are going to interfere in our elections in 2020. And he told them the main way they're going to do this is they are going to continue to hit Americans on the issue of race and racism. That through social media, through a lot of fake news generated by false facts and stories and just things, they're going to continue to infiltrate into our own conscience of how we see each other and we see ourselves. And in fact, after the last Democratic debate, Kamala Harris, who is running for office, there was a record number of what are called bots, which they don't know who owns these sites. A record number of bots flooded social media with all this false information and narrative about Kamala Harris. Moments after the bank. And so again, we have been warned that there are those who would love for us to be against each other and not with each other. But yet, guess what happens? We continue to what? Be torn apart. We continue to see again those flames being fed by leaders in our own country, leaders in other places that seek for us to not see each other as a child of God. That's why I started today with Mr. Rogers. We need Mr. Rogers. 
The problem is Mr. Rogers will probably get fired today. Because Mr. Rogers, again, in this understanding of Christ, came to teach children as they're younger to plant that seed now of love and acceptance and guidance and togetherness. In fact, few people realize that Mr. Rogers, in his first five episodes, the first episodes of his show, and I am not making this up, this is historical. His first five episodes on his show, you might remember if you watched it like I did, there was a leader named King Friday the 13th. That was his name. King Friday the 13th. And King Friday the 13th, in the first five episodes of the show, he built a wall around his kingdom. He built a wall because he said that there was too much change happening in his own kingdom and he had to keep people out of his kingdom because they were bringing in too much change. I'm not kidding you. And so King Friday the 13th built a wall around his kingdom. But Mr. Rogers had one of his other characters every day send up a balloon over the wall that would drop messages of love. And so for five days, these balloons went over the wall and dropped a message of love. And then suddenly King Friday the 13th decided, hey, walls keep love out too. And he tore down his wall. He would, Mr. Rogers would get crucified today <laughs> to teach us about love going over walls and borders. But that's not all Mr. Rogers did. Mr. Rogers, in the days after, and this is astounding, because this is who he was. In the days after Dr. King's assassination, Mr. Rogers had a, a dear friend who was African American, who was actually part of his show more as a cameraman, but his name was Mr. Clemens. And so Mr. Rogers decided that he wanted to send a message to America and again, this was just after the days after Dr. King's assassination. And so he invited his friend Clemens, Francois Clemens, to be the police officer in his neighborhood. And actually, Francois Clemens said, I cannot be a police officer in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. He had grown in very impoverished conditions and had interactions with the police that were not uh, fruit producing of a good fruit. And he told Fred Rogers, I cannot be a police officer. And he said, I need you to be a police officer in my neighborhood. And so finally he agreed he'd be his police officer. And so in this episode, the days after Dr. King's assassination, the episode begins where Mr. Rogers tells the children watching him that it's a hot day today. He actually said, it's so hot, I'm not going to put my sweater on. He said, in fact, it's so hot, I'm going to go outside and I'm going to sit by my pool. And he sat by a little kitty pool. And he rolled his pants up. And Mr. Rogers put his feet in his little kitty pool. And while he's sitting trying to cool off, Officer Clemens stops by. And Mr. Rogers says, hey, officer, are you tired too? And he said, no, I'm hot and tired today. And he said, well, why don't you come in and join me in my pool? And this is the image that went across America in the days after Dr. King's assassination. Now that may not seem like much today, although then again, it might seem like a great deal. But Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, wanted children to see of how important it is for us again to love one another. And Mr. Rogers said, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. So I wanted to have my feet washed with my friends in the same walks so kids could see. And so again, in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, he fought against prejudice and bigotry. He fought against all the things that would seek to divide. And he tried to show how important it is for us to love, to unite and to be together.
That's why, as I said, we need Mr. Rogers back in the neighborhood. We need to have that understanding of our togetherness and our oneness in Christ. When Jesus spoke, I'll close with this today, when Jesus spoke to his disciples and invited them to love one another and told them to go and produce these fruits of the Spirit, know that that happens in John chapter 15, which is called his farewell discourse. It's the last word Jesus speaks to his disciples. He's speaking it to them, you can imagine, in the same upper room where he just washed their feet. He's saying to them, I want you to love one another, to produce fruit that the world can see the love of God in your living. But he's saying to them, in the moments before, they will witness Jesus arrested in the garden, charged falsely before the courts, stripped of his clothing, beaten by whips, given a, a crown of thorns, nailed to a cross, and breathing his lifeless body in the midst of all that violence. He speaks to them with all the violence going to happen around you. Jesus says, but I want you to be my friends. And I want you to bring forth love and what? Joy and what? Peace and what? Patience and what? Kindness and what? Generosity and what? Faithfulness and what? Gentleness and what? Self-control. That's what we are to bring to the world. And it's here when we connect to each other. It's here when we reconnect to be recharged that we are to go forth and bear fruit that will last. Because I just have to ask you today if once again you'll join me in singing a song. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Amen.